Shalom and welcome to Biblical Faith with Sam Peet. We invite you to join us as Sam brings a study in the Torah from the Jewish sages. And now our speaker, Sam Peet. Pirkei Avot, the second chapter of Pirkei Avot, Mishnah number 18. Rabbi Shimon, okay? Again, this is what things we should avoid and things we should do, okay? Rabbi Shimon says, be meticulous in reading the Shema, or saying the Shema, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and in prayer. When you pray, do not make your prayer a set routine, but rather beg for compassion and supplication before the omnipresent. As it is said, and he is quoting from the prophet Yoel, chapter 2 and verse 13, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and relentful of punishment. He's, he, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to chastise you. And finally, do not be a wicked person in private, he says. All right. Now, all of those things, again, on the surface, we can understand. They're, they're, they're not hard to understand, just the simple Peshat meaning. Let's look at what the Maharal says here. He says, in Pirkei Avot, in chapter 1, in Mishnah 2, it says, it told us that the service of God is one of the pillars of the world. It's one of the things that the world stands on, Avodat Hashem, okay? Therefore, he says, this Mishnah, which requires us to exercise, exercise care with the recital of the Shema and with prayers, and in this case, we're talking about the set prayers of Judaism, okay, the morning prayer, the afternoon prayer, and the evening prayer, and the three times that you say the Shema in the morning, in the evening, and on, on your bed, okay? He says, it requires us to exercise care with this. He says, and again, now the Maharal is not writing, thinking that there were going to be bands and bands of non-Jews who would suddenly study his words, okay? So he is writing this to the Jewish people, and in this instance he says, all of these things actually touch upon the very essence of our existence, of the Jewish people's existence as human beings. That's what he's talking about. Why is that? Because this is prayer, the Shema in prayer is avodat balev. It's the duty, the service of the heart, okay? That is the obligation of the Jewish people. Because again, we're not talking about personal prayer here. We're not talking about just sitting and speaking to Hashem. We're talking about the services, the set services. Shacharit, mincha, arvit, okay? That's what he's talking about. Those things have to be done. There's a latest time in the morning you can say the Shema, okay? There's a, a latest time and there's, uh, in, there's different times in the afternoon you can say Mincha. Uh, then after dark you can say Arvit and then the bedtime Shema, whenever that might be, okay? But these have to do, and why are they within these times? Do, you, do we know? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, we know that Abraham... He established the morning service, Yitzhak, the afternoon service, and Yaakov, the evening service. Mm -hmm. But why must these set prayers, these prescribed prayers from a Siddur, why must they be said within certain time periods? Like, like Shacharit has to be done within a certain hours of the morning, okay? Mincha has to be within certain hours of the afternoon, and then Arvit within certain hours of the evening. Do we know why? Every service that we do, as far as prayer service, has a correspondence to a sacrifice that was made in the Holy Temple. And those sacrifices were made between particular hours of the day. Okay? We see, we, this is a very ancient practice. Daniel, this is why Daniel, when he is in Babylon, uh, this is why he opened his window towards Jerusalem. And it's set, the text says very clearly, he prayed at the times of the morning and the afternoon and the evening sacrifice. Actually, there is no evening sacrifice. It's just the morning and the afternoon. Our vit, the evening service, is for those portions that remained on the altar through the evening, through the night. Okay? All right. Now, the Maharal is going to say something here. Somebody's going to say something about how the prayer service replaces the temple service. I understand why they say that, because it's based on a verse 
in the prophet Hosea where he says, you know, the calves of your lips uh, will replace the bulls, will substitute, come in place for the bulls. What we have to understand is in the days of the first and the second temple, the prayer service was already attached to the sacrificial service. It was part of it, okay? We even know that just like there were 24 courses of the priesthood, the entire nation of Israel was also divided into 24 courses, okay? And whenever your course served, served twice a year, okay? Whenever your course served, this is when you were absolutely required to be praying with a minyan in the synagogue at the exact same times that the sacrifices were being offered in Jerusalem. So it's not like, it's really not like that the prayer service comes and takes the place of the temple services. The prayer services today are all we have left of the service of the holy temple. It's what we have left. Is that what the prophet is referring to? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we, we can't make, without a holy temple, we can't make a blood sacrifice today, but we can still say the prayers which were part of that. Okay? So in that sense, the prayer services of the Jewish people that are at set times, they take the place of the service of the Holy Temple. But it's really not like they're substituting for them or that they came in and took their place because they were always attached. The prayer service was always attached to the service of the Holy Temple. Okay. By the way, that is the only reason that to this day we still have the world in existence, to tell you the truth, because it is the service of the Holy Temple that brings the Shefa from above to below. Yeah. And it is the prayer service of the Jewish people which is now, in a sense, in place of that, that is bringing the Shefa from above to below. So okay. let me make sure I get this right, if that's okay. The, the prayers that you do this day. The set prayers. The set prayers. They have, these today have always been attached? Yes. You're doing the same ones? Some of them are very, very ancient. Now we know that the Shemone Esrei, the Amidah, is from the time of the great men of the great assembly, which is between the temples, okay? But some of them are extremely ancient, okay? Uh, so there's parts of the Siddur that go back to the time of the first temple. There are other parts of the Siddur that were put together during the times between the first and the second temple. And then there are other parts of the Siddur that took place just during the second temple. And even afterwards, there's been additions to it made. But the core essence of the morning prayer, the afternoon prayer, and the evening prayer, there are parts of them that are extremely ancient all the way back to the time of the first temple, probably even all the way back to the time of the tabernacle. Okay? Some of them even probably back to the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. For instance, I had a question asked the other, the other night. Before the Shemone, Shemone Esrei, there's a section that's, that talks about Kumah Hashem arise to the aid of Judah and Israel. Now that prayer is actually taken today to, to talk about, and the question was, why, why does it say Judah and Israel? Why doesn't it just say Israel? Okay. Uh, this is, by the way, taken by the new movement within Christianity to talk about how that they're, they're Israel, they're the lost tribes of Israel, which is such a crock. But anyway, let's not get into that. So why? Actually, that tells us, what that tells us, do we remember that after the days of Solomon, the kingdom split to the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, which called itself Israel, and the southern kingdom, which called itself Judah? That means this is a first temple prayer. It actually dates back to the time when there was the division between the people, which is why Judah and Israel both are mentioned in the, in the prayer itself. It doesn't have anything to do with including some non-Jewish people from around the world. That's not the intention of it. Not there. It, it has to do with, it's a very, very ancient prayer from that period of time. Okay? All right. Now let's move on. Be meticulous in reading the Shema and in prayer. The Maharal says, reciting the Shema is an act, and we know this from our study of the Ramchal, an act of accepting the sovereignty of heaven, the yoke of heaven, 
the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. And prayer is the principal service of Hashem while we are without the holy temple. It's also, now see, this is a, to me this is a misunderstanding, and I don't really think the Maharal probably said it this way. I don't have his Hebrew original in front of me, just a translation. Because not only is it while we are without the holy temple, it's a principal service, but it's also a principal service when we have the holy temple. It goes together. These deserve, do we really think that if we rebuild the Holy Temple that we can all, all the Jewish people can stop praying? That we just immediately stop the services? Of course not. But that's the way it comes across sometimes, okay? Yeah, these deserve, he says, meticulous observance because through them we fulfill the very purpose for which we were created. Now the Ramchal, or not the Ramchal, excuse me, my confusion. The Maharal, Rabbi Judah of Prague, he is giving us a big secret here. Through them, through this service, this is the very purpose for which we were created and chosen, by the way, in order to do this service, in order to make the universe operate correctly so that God can pour out his good upon this world. That's what it really is. When you pray, don't make your prayer a set routine. He says, we can learn the correct approach to prayer from the following excerpt from the Talmud, and this is from Barakot 28b. What is meant by set routine? Rabbi Yaakov uh, Baridi said in the name of uh, Rabbi Oshaya, anyone whose prayer is like a burden to him. Uh-oh. Now, for people who don't pray the prayers from the Siddur, you probably don't have a clue what that's, what that's meaning. But for a person who three times a day prays the prayers of the Siddur, there can be some days when you don't feel good. There can be some days when you're distracted by other things. There can be some days when things are not going your way and that you come to the time and it can feel like, wow, do I really have to do this? I'm just going to tell you straight from a Jew's mouth, do I really have to do this again? That's what it means, what Rabbi Shimon means when it says, don't make your prayer set routine. In other words, if it's a burden to you, then you've made it a set routine. That's what he's trying to say. The rabbis say, anyone who does not say it with a supplicating expression, and Rabbi and Rav Yosef both say, anyone who cannot express something original in it. What do they mean? It's their prescribed prayers. How do you express something original in it? Be because you can. <laughs> Absolutely, because you can, because there are even sections there where you're allowed to interject things for yourself or things from your own perspective. Or who's to say you can't, you can interject all kinds of things all the time, okay? Even when you're praying with a congregation, it can still be done. Rabbi uh, Zera said, I can express something original in it, but I'm afraid to actually do so because I'll get distracted, okay, from the flow of everything. But Rashi actually tells us, what, is, what does that mean? Prayer originally was recited by heart, and by many, many Jews who have prayed all their lives, they also do it that way to this day. So prayer was recited by heart, and Rashi is, explains that Rabbi Zerah is concerned that if he departs from the regular text of the prayer, then that'll make him make a mistake. It'll cause him to err when continuing where he left off or uh, uh, after expressing his personal thought. So if you do express something original, you have to be careful that you kick back in in the right spot. Okay. Prayer, the Maharal wants to tell us that prayer, and, we, and this is absolutely the truth. Does anybody think when you go before God that he actually owes you anything? No. And yet... When we pray, and then he doesn't fulfill the prayer the way we, th by the way, he fulfills every prayer, Amen. but he does it the best way. The Baal Shem Tov tells us this. But many times when we pray and it doesn't get fulfilled, it doesn't happen the way, the way we prayed it or the way we think it should be, we can get an attitude. And that mainly is a reflection of that we really think we do deserve we deserve him to do it the way we ask him to do it. 
and we're a little bit ticked off that he didn't. I know this is a this is a true a real problem. And by the way, your Yetzirah can take that feeling and and will use it to keep you from ever praying again because he didn't do what you asked him to do, and you deserved it. Mm. We don't deserve it. And we also have to have a level of trust where we trust him that he does answer and that he answers in the best way. Amen. Now, that's not always easy. I'm going to tell you, that's not, um, that's not always easy. But that is the secret. That really is the secret, is to have so much trust in him that we know that when we ask him that, of course, he says yes. That's what the Paul told me. He really doesn't say no. But he says, I'll fulfill your request in exactly the best way. And then we have to be big enough and trust him enough and be small enough and know that we don't deserve it, okay, to let him fulfill it in the, in the way that he wants to and then tell him thank you, even if we never even know it. Okay. It must be a supplication. It must be expressed in the way that we would plead for a favor from someone. Prayer that is just routine obligation, that is not proper, in other words, and we already found out what that is, we kind of feel like it's a burden. Let me hurry up and get through with this, you know. Is not properly considered the service of Hashem, of Adat Hashem, for the following reason. The phrase, the service of God, of Adat Hashem, means if it's service, it means that we're his servants. Indeed, <laughs> servant is a nice word for a slave, is what the Maharal is saying. We're his slaves. We cultivate that relationship by being aware. Listen to what he says. It's so interesting the way he puts it because all the great sages, they always put, you know, we think we got it down and we have it down pat, but they always bring, every, every sage will always bring his own particular slice of the pie. And this is the Maharal's here. He says, how do we cultivate a relationship of being a slave? By being aware that we need God. And not only that, we are totally dependent upon him. Absolutely, completely, and totally dependent upon him. Just like a slave is for, to his master. He's totally dependent to his master for absolutely everything he has, for the clothes on his back, to the bed that he sleeps in, to the shoes on his feet, to the food in his belly. Totally dependent. We should realize that everything he does for us, and this is also a hard one, especially if you're having a hard time, but it's still the truth, that he does for us comes from his mercy and his compassion because he doesn't owe us anything. If a person prays with the attitude that God ought to do his request, then he is not totally dependent upon him, and he falls short of being his servant. These are words we really need to, to get a hold of because they're very, very true. This is the idea of what it means to have, by the way, self-composure. <laughs> self-composure means that from our study of the Torah, we learn what is the truth. Now, we may think we know what the truth is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do. And what we are looking at here when it comes to prayer, what Rabbi Shimon is telling us, this is Torah truth. And you have to take that truth, and even though, even though it goes against your better judgment, even though it, you, you may say, well, that's not my experience, well, hold on, you really haven't lived life according to this truth yet. You know what I'm saying? You haven't, because it's not part of you yet. You have to put that part of you in there, and then you can begin to have real self-composure because you know what the truth is, and you've clarified the truth from the Torah. And the truth of the matter is, is he doesn't really owe us anything. And you may say, oh, well, he, he owes me something. He, he, he made me, he separated me, he put me in a body, on and on and on. No, you actually agreed to every one of those things. You even begged him to do it, okay? So he doesn't really owe you anything. And we have to understand that we're just tiny souls, and he is the king of the universe, and that we are totally dependent upon him for absolutely everything. And that is the Torah truth. Yeah. But what does, what does Rabbi Shimon say? He says, beg for compassion and supplication. 
The essence of supplication, he says, what is the essence of supp supplication? Here again is another torture. We may think it's, uh, you know, beating or throwing dirt on our head and just saying how sorry we are and how terrible we are and persecuting ourselves for everything we've ever done in the past and all these things and, and on and on and every mistake we've ever made and asking him in that case for forgiveness and on and on and to give you whatever you need. But that's really not what supplication is. He tells us, what's the sore truth? To humble oneself. To, not, to become the idea of bitul, the idea of that you're actually a nothing. To do away with this pride, and, and pride comes directly from the will to receive for yourself alone. To humble oneself before Hashem and to beg of Him like a slave before His master. Then he finally adds, he says, this is not possible just by thought. Now we can think it, but it's not completely possible by thought alone is what he's saying. In fact, we should be going around all the time like Rebbe Nachman teaches. He says, you know, you can be in a big crowd of people and you can scream unbelievably so in your mind and nobody will ever even hear you, but Hashem will hear you, okay? But to, be, to humble yourself before Him, it has, to, it has to be put into action. This is not possible by thought alone. It requires an action. For there is no comparison, he says, between one who humbles himself in his thoughts and one who actually humbles himself through deeds. Therefore, prayer must entail some physical action. And for that reason, we pray through speech and not just in thought. That's also why in the set prayers, there are actions that you do. Moving three steps forward, moving three steps back, bowing to the left, bowing to the right, bowing forward, bending the knees, on Yom Kippur falling on your face, all of those things, acting it out. Because if it's real, it has to be more than just up here. And that's the key. He says, since the substance of prayer is speech, and we've talked about this before, this is the power of a human being, is speech, voice, cold. The rabbis, he says, of the cited passage required praying with language that expresses the supplicatory nature of the prayer. Feelings alone, he has in a footnote, do not fulfill the requirement of praying in a, suppl uh, in a supplication manner. So you have to, it has to come out of your mouth. And that's the key to understanding what his next thing is. In other words, it can't be by just thought alone. His next thing is says, and do not be a wicked person in private. Now, of course, what that's meaning is that away from everybody else's eyes, you're like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But Rabbi Shimon is actually talking about not only physically so, but mentally so. In other words, I can put on Generally speaking, most of the time, a person can put on a front completely to other people and be thinking something entirely different. It doesn't always work all 100% of the time. Generally speaking, a guard gets let down somewhere and what's up here comes out some way, okay? But this is what Rabbi Shimon is really talking about. He's not just talking about being a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the body. He's talking about also being that way in your mind. God, he says, will fulfill the petition of one who knows that he needs him and he depends upon him completely. This is another secret the Maharal is giving us. However, one, one who has gone outside the bounds of proper behavior, even in private, might still not have his prayers answered. Well, of course, uh, if you're being a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde per, uh, kind of person, your prayers aren't probably even actually making it anywhere. The primary meaning, he says, of the term Russia, a wicked fellow, a wicked person, this is so important, is one who is wicked to other people. As we find in the verse, and this is from Exodus chapter 2 and verse 13, and he said to the wicked one, why do you hit your fellow? Okay? Now immediately, and I don't want to beat on anybody's head here, I need to beat on my own. But immediately we think physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just physical. It's also verbal. It's also mental. Okay? This is what a rasha actually means. And I remember when we studied this with Rabbi Ashlag, 
in uh, his introduction to the study of the tense he wrote where he talks about this. It's an amazing eye-opener thing to see what, what does Hashem call a wicked person. Hashem calls a wicked person to be someone who is wicked. The example that was given there is someone who's judging other people. Whoops. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard. And see, this is another, this is actually another example of Torah truth that we have to literally get a hold of and literally implant with us and internalize to the point where it becomes ours. And then you can be self-composed. Then you can be self-composed where nothing bothers you, where, where, <laughs> where you don't get upset about such nonsensical things. You might get upset about how the nations treat Israel and Jerusalem and how they're trying to talk us into, you know, killing ourselves into self-suicide or something. You might get upset about that, but you won't get upset about minor things because you'll be self-composed because you have Torah truth and you know exactly what it is. And because you're always praying to Hashem and you're always dependent upon Him and you come to the point where you know that everything that's going on around you and even in your head is coming from Him. Let's finish this. We have just a few minutes. The term Russia can also be applied, he says, in a more general sense to anyone who goes outside the bounds of propriety. The Mishnah enjoins us not to be wicked, even in a degree that doesn't affect others, but is discerned only by oneself. Which, by the way, you should, that, that term judging others also can apply to you if, if your judgment of yourself is in self-persecution or self-punishment. That also is wicked. Although such a person is not a rasha in the primary sense of the word, he is still in the general category of a rasha. Wickedness is so serious and so pernicious. In other words, it infects all kinds of things. It just infiltrates everything. That even a minor degree of it is, can be extremely destructive. What is the connection between do not be a wicked person and the earlier two statements that address prayer? Because prayer is the service of Hashem in the place of the sacrificial service in place of the sacrificial service in the temple. And the scripture says, and this is from Proverbs 15, 18, Mishle 15, 18, the sacrifice of the wicked, meaning also the prayer of the wicked, is an abomination to Hashem. He doesn't like it. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. The Mishnah intends to say, even if you are a Rasha, but only privately, only in your head, or only behind a closed door, and no one else knows about it at all, still Hashem knows about it, and your prayer, as a result, is not acceptable to him. The three statements of this Mishnah share the single goal of improving our service to God, of God by improving the quality of our prayer. And even though he's talking about the set prayers here, we can take everything that he said here and still apply it also to our own personal private prayer with Hashem. Okay. Because I'm not telling you if you're, if you're not Jewish, that you should actually be praying the prescribed prayers. You can, but you don't, you're not under that obligation. But you are under the obligation to do private prayer, everyone, without any doubt whatsoever. And everything we've talked about here can also apply to it. Okay. I have big news. Ooh. I'm completely, totally finished. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to go one more centimeter. Okay. Uh, because number one, the whole lesson tonight beat me up so badly that I cannot continue. <laughs> Actually, I think it beat us all a little bit. You, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. There's stuff here that we really need to get a hold of and really begin to learn what it means to internalize a Torah truth because Torah truth is not always exactly what we think or what's been injected uh, into us by others and others' attitudes towards the world mm -hmm. or even by their own experience. We have to get a hold of the truth of the Torah, put it in our, inside ourselves, clarify it and clarify it, and ask Hashem to help us. That's the most important thing. If we don't, because we can't do it, we can do absolutely nothing by ourselves. Because like Rabbi Shimon is saying, and the Maharal is saying, we are totally dependent upon God for everything. And the sooner we learn that, the better off we'll, much, we'll be much better off. So ask Him to help you. And believe it or not, He'll help you. And now sometimes that also can be painful. Okay, so don't get discouraged if, if, if it takes a little pain to get to that point. It's well worth it, I promise you. And be, and be steadfast with it about internalizing Torah truth, asking Hashem for help, 
uh, in, in moving forward. That's really what we're studying for. If we're studying just so we can have a good time and just stay right where we're at, then we're just, yeah. we're, we're not really doing anything. We're not really doing anything for the sake of heaven. <laughs> we're doing it just to be comfortable. And uh, so, well, also unfortunately, sometimes we have to be uncomfortable to be able to move on, but I promise you it'll be worth it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so Baruch Hashem and Shalom of Raka to you, peace and a blessing. Bye-bye. Shalom, shalom. Thank you for joining us in our study. If you enjoyed this study and are interested in learning more from the Torah and the sages of Israel, then check us out on the internet at www.bfm101.com or you may contact us toll-free at 1-800-639-0169. Our mailing address is Biblical Faith, P.O. Box 2, Abilene, Texas, 79604. Until next time, we wish you shalom uvakah, peace and a blessing.